Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Revealing the Hidden Landscape of Structural Variants in Cancer Genomes, presented by Dr. Jonas Korlach, Chief Scientific Officer, Pacific Biosciences. I'm Xavier Gutierrez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of, the, of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Korlach. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Yeah, thank you very much and hello everyone. And uh, thank you to the organizers. It's a great pleasure to be back at uh, Lab Roots. And today's um, presentation, as you heard, is uh, about cancer. And I'd like to uh, highlight how PEC biosequencing uniquely can identify um, structure variants and other features of cancer biology and cancer genomes that are otherwise hidden uh, with previous technologies. So the topics for today, I'd like to start with a brief technology update and then uh, focus most of the time on applications and opportunities that are provided by long-range PEC biosequencing in three areas, structural genetic variation, in the area of targeted sequencing, and in the area of full-length RNA-seq, or ISIS-seq as we call it. And then I'll close by giving an update and an outlook on our technology roadmap. So with regard to sequencing and sequencing performance, there are three main categories that uh, you want to look at. And uh, really, whenever you evaluate any sequencing technology, those are the three areas that matter with regard to performance. And fundamentally, what we've tried to do in PEC biosequencing is to give the best possible performance in all three criteria and categories simultaneously. So um, uh, coincidentally, yesterday, we uh, um, released officially the latest uh, sequencing chemistry. And so I'm uh, happy to report that uh, we further in increased the uh, throughput and uh, the yield in these categories. So I'm going to go through them briefly. So with regard to uh, the read length, the length of the sequence reads, as you know, PECBio provides very long reads that are now up to 30 kilobases on average for genomic DNA and up to 100 kilobases on average for amplicon. On the right, I have shown uh, just two representative examples. On the top is genomic DNA, uh, human DNA, and you can see that uh, the average is well over 30 uh, kilobases. In fact, a metric which is called the read N50, that's the uh, read length which harbors uh, more than half of the data. So more than half of the reads are in, more than half of the bases are in reads greater than 48 kilobases. And then for amplicons, it's even um, longer. So the read N50 there, half of the data is in reads that span more than 135 kilobases. With regard to high consensus accuracy, that's always been high because the errors are random. As you know, on the raw read level, the errors are higher in PEC biosequencing, but because the errors are random, you reach consensus very quickly. Uh, in fact, with this new chemistry, um, the raw read error is uh, reduced so that you reach consensus more quickly. Now at 20-fold coverage, you reach QB40 or 99.99%, and at around 40-fold coverage, you reach QB50 or 99.999% or less than one error in a 100,000 sequence basis. And then similarly, it's always been the case, there's very minimal bias with regard to uh, sequence complexity or what's shown here on the right, the GC content. So regardless of whether your DNA sequence is AT rich or GTC rich, you get the same kind of read length and uh, base quality. And that really simplifies the bioinformatic analysis because it's much more uniform uh, compared to other data sets like Illumina data. And so this has been, um, uh, proven and demonstrated in the community by many papers uh, and commentaries highlighting the advantages of smart sequencing, uh, comparing bias with regard to those different technologies, 
and then a more recent paper looking for the applications and utilities towards the clinical sequencing and medical diagnostics. The authors uh, concluded that smart sequencing offers advantages over short read sequencers, and I will highlight some of those in particular with regard to oncology and cancer research. And so fundamentally what we were trying to do then, as I mentioned, is to build a system that has very good performance in all three of those criteria and not compromise like other technologies do. For example, of course, the short read sequencers, they don't have long reads and they also have quite a pronounced bias. And then other long read or linked read sequencing technologies may have long reads, but they suffer from systematic errors, systematic bias, and also um, with regard to coverage bias. Now, initially, of course, this um, kind of performance came at a price, and that was the reduced throughput, but we have worked very hard on uh, increasing the throughput now by over 2,000-fold compared to the initial launch um, back about six years ago, first on the RS2 and now on the SQL system, so that uh, now on genomic DNA, you get up to 20 gigabases per smart cell run and up to 50 gigabases per smart cell uh, run for amplicons. And currently, it's possible to run 12 cells in a walkaway operation on the SQL machine. So with a, a push of a button, you can generate up to 600 gigabases or 0.6 terabases per machine run. And so that now, it's all based on the same foundation of high quality that I mentioned earlier. And so now we're reaching a fairly serious throughput that makes a number of projects that previously would have been perhaps too slow or too cost uh, prohibitive, makes them affordable and uh, um, doable in a timely manner. And so because of these improvements, we've seen a steady increase in the adoption and in the publication output here, the historical evolution of the peer-reviewed publications that feature PEC biosequencing in all fields of science, not just cancer. So there are well over 4,300 publications. About five new papers are published every day on average that highlight the utilities and the advantages of smart sequencing over other techniques. And so uh, with this introduction, I'd like to highlight um, for the rest of the talk the opportunities that exist in cancer research specifically to the three topics I mentioned. So I'd like to start with structural genetic variation. Structural variants are larger differences from the reference genome. So uh, you know about SNPs, and that's a one base pair change. And structure variants, by contrast, have been defined as differences to the reference genome that are 50 base pairs and larger. And there are many different types. Um, so you can have um, sequence deleted uh, or novel sequence inserted. There are tandem duplications, interspersed duplications, inversions, translocations. And all of these different kinds of variation have been um, termed under the umbrella term structure variation. And it has also been recognized that the short read sequencer, like Illumina, are not very well suited to sequence and resolve this type of genetic variation. Uh, here are just two examples where uh, in a review article by uh, Rick Wilson and Evan Eichler and Mark Chasen, uh, it was noted that short read parallel sequencing is insufficient to generate uh, high quality genome assemblies or to resolve most structure variation. And uh, so far that in a commentary by the editors of Nature Genetics, they started the article by saying that it's time to stop thinking that just doing more DNA sequencing, meaning more short read sequencing, will give us the variants that determine human traits. And so um, the ability by PEC biosequencing to uh, reveal this hidden variation was highlighted over the past few years, starting with a Nature paper uh, entitled Resolving the Complexity of the Human Genome, really for the first time using single molecule sequencing. Um, highlighting that it's now possible to resolve this type of genetic variation, and then followed by quite a number of examples, I've just listed two here, of ethnically specific de novo assemblies of human genomes. This was the Chinese reference genome. Here's the Korean reference genome, and there have been others in the past. In fact, we know of now over 40 publicly available assemblies uh, using PEC biosequencing data. And on our website, and you see the um, uh, link on the bottom, I encourage you to uh, uh, check this out. It's an interactive map where you can click on the different types of uh, genome assemblies and get more information, get the accession numbers to the database and so forth. And so uh, PacBio has clearly been uh, a leader in redefining uh, the reference genomes and the ethnicities thereof. 
Now, why is that important in cancer? And uh, just to give one example of why that is, um, it's a very nice review article that appeared in PLOS One a few years ago, highlighting that there is a strong relationship between the ethnic background of the patient and their evaluation of their cancer risk. So it was highlighted in this article that most cancer markers do not validate in an ethnic group other than uh, the one that um, constituted the discovery cohorts. And the authors looked in very detail in six um, cancer studies addressing the association between cancer risk and allelic variations, and they found that a significant result in one ethnic group was usually not reproducible in other ethnicities in well-powered studies. So it very much matters um, looking at the particular ethnicity and looking at all the genetic variation, looking at SNPs and this type of structural variation. Now, do we have a complete picture of all the variants that drive cancer in these different ethnicities? And the answer is clearly no. Um, through these studies of um, high PEC biofold coverage, looking at these ethnic genomes, uh, much of the structural variation was discovered de novo um, and discovered for the first time. Uh, there are about 20,000 events, roughly balanced, about 10,000 deletions over 50 bases and 10,000 insertions that exist between human genomes that make them different from each other. And with PecBio, it was then shown that you can uh, capture all of these, whereas uh, with Illumina, you see on the bottom left, you only capture about 4,000. You miss about 16,000. And on the bottom right is shown a um, uh, just a simple schematic highlighting that actually in terms of number of bases, the majority of um, the bases that make us different from each other are in these types of structure variants. Um, there are about 20,000 events, but because they're larger, they harbor many, many bases. And so um, these PecBio uh, genome projects revealed that we had significantly underestimated the abundance of these types of variants, even in normal and healthy genomes, and uh, certainly in cancer genomes as well. It's also been known from, for example, the Cancer Genome Atlas and other large-scale consortia studies um, that structure variants are common in most cancers. So here's just one example of analyzing pan-cancer patterns uh, for somatic copy number alterations. And they studied thousands of samples, found that whole genome duplication events were very common, but also that there were recurrent focal hotspots for copy number variants that were identified in each chromosome. In, um, and that indicates that just like single base variation, some structure variants are likely driver mutations are under very strong selective pressure, highlighting the need to sequence these and to resolve them and to understand them if you want, we want to understand cancer biology and cancer progression. And so uh, quite recently, a, a few months ago, there was, uh, I, I think, a landmark paper by Mike Schatz, who's depicted here on the upper right, on, for the first time, comprehensively characterizing a cancer genome with regard to all types of genetic variation. And so he utilized the uh, very well-studied breast cancer cell line, SKBR3, and in this uh, genome research paper, um, uh, looked at um, this particular genome with smart sequencing, revealed nearly 20,000 variants found, most of which were actually missed by the short read sequencing comparison. In addition, he did full-length transcriptome sequencing, that uh, revealed several novel gene fusions um, within and these very complex genetic variants. And so as a comparison of short and long read technologies for cancer genome analysis, this paper revealed that there's a significant gap in our knowledge about the complexity of cancer genomes. So I encourage you to uh, check out this paper in full. Just a couple um, examples. So long range structure variants were found. Um, thousands of insertions, deletions, duplications, and inversions, and uh, translocations. And then on the right, you see the comparison on the left column is the long read um, variant size distribution, and on the right is the short read comparison. And so you can see there's hardly any red and uh, very, very few blue as well with the short read uh, technology. So the short reads miss nearly all of the insertions and uh, the vast majority of the deletions that were called by smart sequencing. So I think this figure on the right uh, highlights very powerfully and visually um, how much is missed when you just do Illumina short read sequencing. And here's just one other example of 
understanding and highlighting and resolving these very complex gene fusions. So ISIS-seq, I'm going to talk a little bit later, uh, identified 53 putative gene fusions. Many of them were previously unknown. And then uh, Mike and Maria Nadestad wrote the software, Split Threader, that can be used to systematically search for these putative gene fusions. And so you can see that these can be sometimes very complex. This particular fusion has components from three chromosomes, 8, 14, and 17. And because of the long reads and the contiguity that you get with PEC biosequencing data, you can resolve this unequivocally, uh, which is not possible for short read techniques. So the key takeaways from this uh, really landmark paper that uh, I think justifiably got uh, featured on the cover of the genome research uh, issue, I think two months ago, uh, where that uh, long read sequencing um, resolved far more bases in the genome that are affected by structure variants compared to just a single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, they showed that long read sequencing can expose complex variants with great certainty in context, suggesting that there are uh, these very complex gene fusions, inverted duplications, and complex events may be found in other cancer genomes. And um, uh, because these other types of complex variants are likely present in other cancer genomes that were not found in this particular breast cancer cell line, uh, the authors believe that it is essential to continue building a catalog of these variant types using the best available technologies in order to enhance our understanding of cancer. So just a couple, just one, I think one more example on a renal cell carcinoma, um, a paper that came out uh, a little while back, looking at structure variations. Uh, the authors looked at um, 66 tumor samples and did an exhaustive genomic analysis to uncover possible driver mutations. And they found that 10% of these types of tumors had an overexpression in this particular gene that was driven by structure variants, and the breakpoints of these rearrangements were precisely mapped with the PEC viral long range uh, amplicon sequencing. So Mike Schatz's paper was a whole genome approach, and this one was a targeted approach to look at these kinds of structure rearrangements. And so here's another example on the lower right uh, from the University of um, uh, California, San Diego, uh, highlighting that these types of genetic rearrangements uh, can, number one, be driver mutations. And number two, they're often not captured with next generation sequencing, but are visible with long read sequencing. The second topic that I'd like to talk about is targeted sequencing, and specifically how the long reads can uh, facilitate phasing of mutations over the two different alleles. And so this has been, of course, recognized as a very important aspect of now we're talking about mostly single nucleotide polymorphisms, so single base changes. And there, it matters critically to understand whether, if you have two mutations, as shown in this very simple schematic, whether these two mutations indicated by the X are present on uh, the two different alleles. So of course, you have two copies in every cell, one from the mother and one from the father. So you have two copies of every gene. And for example, in cancer, of course, if you have tumor suppressor genes, it matters whether those two mutations are on the two different alleles, which means in the top that both alleles are defective, both genes are now uh, defective, or whether those two same mutations are uh, co-occurring and are phased with regard to one another on the same allele. And in this particular case, you will have one allele that's you know, doubly defective, but the other allele critically is still intact. And so this has important ramifications for understanding cancer progression and also understanding patient treatment. So the ability of the long reads to immediately provide these kinds of linkage relationships has been uh, recognized early on. This is an older paper phasing um, these types of SNPs with smart sequencing, and the paper concluded that um, smart sequencing can immediately provide the linkage relationships between the SNPs in the target segment. And that makes it, of course, inherently computationally much more simple because you get the uh, information out within an individual long read uh, rather than with Illumina, where you have to try to piece that together for the uh, short read. So uh, this paper highlighted in uh, a gene called MET88, uh, looking at exon 5, com directly comparing the smart technology of Illumina, finding great concordance. But then you can see on the, um, uh, on the right that with Illumina, uh, for two of these very well-known mutations, it says, you, where you can see, it says no reads, no reads. And so this also highlights 
the bias that you sometimes have in Illumina, just not giving you any information. And so the lack of bias with PEC biosequencing can get you the full coverage and the full mutation load of these particular uh, both cell lines and primary tumors. And then um, finally, the linkage, the long reads provide you the linkage information so they un allow you to understand that in many cases there's much higher heterogeneity. So not just two haplotypes and two alleles, but in some cases three or four, and then gives you an immediate idea about how these particular types of um, configurations can have occurred as is shown in the middle of the schematic. Uh, another example about uh, characterizing the clonality of these complex tumors um, as the mutations accumulate in a tumor, it's important to understand whether multiple mutations occur um, on this front and come from the same tumor cell or whether they're from different tumor cells. That would be called polyclonality. And uh, this is a, um, um, a relatively new paper looking at leukemia um, uh, types of cancer and showing uh, powerfully that with the Sanger and the short read technologies uh, in the middle panel here, um, not all the mutations were identified and also they were not phased. So compare, this is on a patient in panel A on the top you see in a patient um, that was monitored and sampled over a, a particular time period in 2008 in August and then again in July of 2013. And then uh, the same sample was subjected to Sanger and short read sequencing. Uh, two mutations were found in August with these technologies, and then uh, six mutations in July. And then compare that to the long read smart sequencing results, where you can actually find many more mutations for both time points, and also ambiguous, unambiguously say that none of these were phased, none of these came from the same tumor cell, and all of these came from uh, different tumor cells. So, really quite pronounced polyclonality, which was uh, otherwise hidden from these um, uh, NGS data. And so this was done with amplicons. The same is true, of course, with capture, prophase capture. Um, and uh, you know we don't have a preference of whether you want to use SureSelect or Mimblegen or IDT or the different kind of uh, technologies that are out there. But you can visually very clearly see that there's um, a big difference between uh, looking at five kilobase, so 5,000 base fragments of PecBio on the top panel, the two panels, immediately phasing the mutations. And you can see that in this particular example, all five heterozygous SNPs uh, are based on one allele, and the other allele is completely concordant with the reference genome. That information is lost with the Illumina 200 base pair short reads because the contiguity and the con connectivity is not long enough to provide you that information. Uh, here's another example of another cancer, um, another gene that's important in cancer. Um, and again, you can see the resolving power. And with Illumina, again, because of bias, you don't even get full coverage of this region. So you're actually missing some of these uh, variants altogether. Then with regard to some cancer genes, um, the analysis is further complicated uh, in the sense that there are pseudogenes um, present. So, this was nicely reviewed by a um, review paper by Birgit Funke two years ago, looking at highly homologous genes in the molecular diagnostic setting. Um, of course, it is now recognized that there are well over 10,000 unique pseudogenes uh, that are associated to um, uh, genes. And these are challenging for short reads on uh, next generation sequencing and also Sanger sequencing because the sequences are so similar. So in this paper, you have what you can see on the top highlighted in pink, these so-called NGS dead zones. So those are all genes listed here that we know cause the diseases uh, that are listed on the right, but uh, they can't currently be accessed. And so our analysis indicates that there's about 200 of those, and over 80% of those are now resolvable with the PEC biotechnology. And I just want to highlight one gene that's important in cancer, and that's PMS2. PMS2 is causing uh, mutations in PMS2 cause Lynch syndrome, which is an aggressive form of hereditary colon cancer. The PMS2 gene is very large. It's about 30 KB, and that's shown here on the top um, in this uh, blue designation. And the analogy is complicated by the fact that there is a pseudogene nearby that extends over about half of the size of the gene and has a very high homology over a 99% sequence identity, which makes the analysis very challenging. Um, we have undertaken this analysis 
looking at full length uh, amplicons of this particular portion. And as you can see on the top, you can design primers so that only the gene will amplify because the forward primer is outside of the region that um, harbors the pseudogene. And so on the bottom are two samples that are uh, highlighted. And the result that you get are two sequences. Each of them are 16 kilobase uh, in length for each sample. And those represent the fully phased, full length um, uh, consensus sequence with all the variation uh, resolved for the mother and the father allele. The next example in targeted sequencing that I would like to highlight is a, a fairly recent paper um, that is um, also relevant to leukemia, and specifically T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And uh, the authors uh, use smart sequencing to reveal and then show the biological significance of having these dual mutations and uh, uh, allowing a visibility of whether they are phased um, on one allele or whether they occur on different alleles. So um, this uh, JAK3 uh, tyrosine kinase is mutated in 10 to 16 percent of all these cases. And then these mutations uh, in JAK3 allow for uh, constitutive activation of these that downstream genes, even in the act absence of these activating cytokines that are normally required for T cell maturation and proliferation during development. So it's, uh, these mutations can then uh, lead to proliferation and cell growth and eventually can lead to the cancer. And so um, for some of the samples, the authors applied PEC biosequencing to determine whether multiple mutations were on the same allele or were on two different alleles. And they found that about one third of those mutants um, cases either had a homozygous or a dual JAK3 mutations. And then they were able to uh, precisely and quantitatively break out whether on individual reads, both mutations were identified or whether they were uh, on diff coming from different cancer cells. And so uh, the, the first conclusion was that there was a stepwise accumulation of these mutations, first this one, and then the additional ones were la acquired later. But it's, in this figure, it's shown that it's precisely important to understand and have the knowledge of whether you have these double mutants because uh, the uh, independent growth in these mouse and model cells is highly dependent on whether these mutations happen on the same allele or whether they happen on individual uh, alleles. So you can see there's quite a dramatic difference in the uh, uh, cell growth. And so uh, the conclusion is that phasing of these cancer mutations here again is a real key to understanding their biological significance and phasing potentially additive mutants in these distinct protein domains also requires uniquely this long read sequencing. Um, so I hope these, these types of examples give you um, an idea of how long read sequencing can be quite powerful used. And so before I, I move over to the next subject, I just wanted to mention that with regard to the procedure, um, we've now made it uh, quite straightforward. We have uh, barcodes that allow you to pool many samples for this type of targeted sequencing, whether it's amplicons or whether it's probe-based enrichment. Um, you can add the barcodes and then pool hundreds of targets and hundreds of samples in a single tube, uh, sequence that in one smart cell, and then the software will automatically demultiplex uh, the different barcodes and, and analyze for each barcode and give you the final result. And so that makes it uh, cost effective and uh, allows the um, processing and sequencing of many samples. And then um, the other consideration that I'd like to uh, just conclude with is that um, in contrast to short read or Sanger sequencing, when your target region becomes, let's say, greater than one kilobase and it becomes very cumbersome where you then now have to walk yourself through with multiple PCRs and multiple primers or have short reads that you need to assemble, none of that complexity is necessary with PEC biosequencing because we have long reads up to 10 kb. And I've, given you, I've shown you an example of 16 kilobases. Um, we would confidently say that whatever amplicon you can make, no matter how long it is, and no matter what sequence it is, you can sequence that in one piece and give you the full information. So that makes it a lot easier, uh, both from the library prep and the uh, initial PCR uh, context, as well as uh, from the bioinformatic analysis. 
So then I'd like to close with one last example. I've, I've um, highlighted examples on how there are many opportunities for long retargeted sequencing with PecBio that go beyond the you know, 250 bases that are schematically shown on the left that you can get with Illumina uh, on the right to uh, discriminate genes from pseudogenes, uh, get full-length phase gene sequencing, look at extreme sequence context. And the last example that I want to show in the area of cancer relevance is for minor variant detection of phasing, where you detect these um, minor variants of tumor-related mutations in a background of a large excess of normal um, um, cells, uh, wild-type cells, and then also phase those mutations and understanding whether they come from the same cancer cell or not. So um, for this, we have a unique way of doing the sequencing. All the um, previous examples that I talked about were based on standard sequencing, uh, which is shown on the left. Uh, and as you may know, PacBio has a unique way of sequencing, which we call circular consensus sequencing, where you ligate these hairpin adapter to each end of the double-stranded DNA molecule. And then the polymerase will go around the structure multiple times and sequence the same DNA molecule multiple times and gets you information about the forward strand and the reverse strand of that same molecule. And that allows you to get very highly accurate uh, consensus sequences on an individual DNA molecule. And of course, that is important in these mixed samples um, that uh, um, uh, occur often in, in cancer samples. And actually, the, the JAK3 uh, example is already one. Uh, the second one is in the area of um, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. And uh, a paper here by researchers in Sweden uh, highlighted the unique capability of single molecule long uh, sequencing, in this case of cDNA, of the full BCR ABL uh, gene to identify mutations at a very low level allow for the earlier detection of these mutations that may confer resistance to the particular drug treatment. So the authors show that in some cases it would have been possible to detect uh, a particular resistance mutations four months earlier compared to what they were doing before. And then significantly, because now it's possible to sequence the entire BCR able gene, they pick up mutations that were missed by other methods, all the ones with an asterisk, as you see on the bottom legend, uh, were missed by other methods, and identify these compound mutations. So are there doubly resistant mutants? Um, and of course, that is very relevant because similarly to the picture before, if you have uh, two mutations, two resistance mutations, but they come from different tumor cells, the combination drug therapy on the top still work because drug A kills tumor cell one and drug B kills tumor cell two. However, if both of these mutations are inside the same tumor cell, that tumor cell will now be multi-drug resistant and the combination drug therapy will fail. So the authors in Sweden have that now as part of their clinical routine um, uh, laboratory tests and, and care of patients uh, in a superior method of screening these patients and uh, uh, informing about um, uh, their drug uh, therapy there in Sweden. So as the third uh, topic then, and I've already transitioned because the last example was in the area of um, full-length RNA-seq or IsoSeq as we call it, it's been well understood now that um, the full complexity of the transcriptome, so all the different gene products and messenger RNA isoforms cannot be fully resolved and characterized with the short read technologies. And PecBio's IsoSeq or isoform sequencing solution provides a much superior uh, workflow there because of the long reads. You get full-length cDNA reads, and each read coming off the machine is automatically a full-length isoform. And so there's no assembly required, and there's full certainty about these particular splice isoforms. Um, long reads are one thing, but then the lack of bias, once again, matters as well. Uh, this is from an earlier paper in detail um, comparing the different technologies. So you see on the top here, uh, there was still 4x4, then the different flavors of Illumina, PecBio, and then uh, Ion Torrent. And um, in the y-axis, you see it's the mRNA from the 5' prime to the 3' prime in these heat maps. And you can just visually already see that PecBio has a much more even representation, especially on the ends of the transcript um, with regard to the sequencing depth and getting high-quality sequence. 
So there are many publications on this method, on this ISOSEQ method, well over 100. And on the bottom here is the link to our publication reference database if you're interested. And I just want to give a couple of examples um, how this has been utilized in the area of oncology and cancer. I'm going to start with uh, what is probably one of the now classical and, and one of the first ICC papers. This was back published already five years ago in 2013, um, looking at what was probably the best studied um, human transcriptome, that's embryonic stem cells. And even though literally billions of alumina reads have been spent on this sample, the authors found uh, many new genes, 273 genes, many new isoforms, and concluded that uh, the process, even the process of identifying all the genes in the human genome uh, is likely far from complete. And I'm showing this example because I wanted to highlight that in some cases it can take some time to then understand the importance of these novel genes. So in the second paper, a few of those 273 new genes were um, studied in more detail by this group, and they found that it's precisely those new genes that have a, uh, a big role in regular, regulating pluripotency during human pre-implantation development or nuclear reprogramming. So those are key uh, processes that also help to understand cancer biology at the fundamental molecular level. And so it's, um, uh, it was a very nice example that these new discoveries are not just uh, genes or junk that nobody cares about. It was precisely the genes that uh, people needed to know about to understand these important processes. If you're interested, there was a very nice technology feature in Nature uh, highlighting the story a little bit more and how it went from understanding and discovering these new genes to then uh, elucidating their function. Um, with regard to uh, long non-coding RNAs, um, this is uniquely now possible in a high throughput manner with long read sequencing. This paper by the GenCode um, Consortium um, in Nature Genetics very nicely um, highlights this. And this paper alone approximately doubles the number of um, uh, targeted loci, the number of long non-coding RNAs in the human genome, um, outperforming existing short read techniques. Um, they definitively characterize the genomic features of these types of RNAs. And uh, because it's now done in an automated uh, and high throughput fashion, it removes a long-standing bottleneck for transcriptome annotation, generating these um, high-quality full-length transcript models at high throughput scales. How can that be used um, towards uh, clinical research? Uh, the first example is in the area of colorectal cancer. Um, of course, the earlier you identify the colorectal cancer, the better it is treatable, and the current test are, um, um, there's colonoscopy, but the current uh, tests that are non-invasive uh, don't have very good sensitivity, and uh, they have specifically very bad specificity, uh, sorry, very bad sensitivity of only about 27% uh, when you deal with the precancerous, with the abnormals, and um, that means that the detection is often later than optimal, and the survival rate and the treatment is much, um, much worse. Um, so new biomarkers are needed to improve the early detection, and it's been known that um, gene splicing, mRNA splicing, plays a major role in tumor progression, and then that the proteins that arise from these misspliced mRNAs may make very good biomarkers for identifying these precursor lesions as well as the tumors for an earlier detection. And so in this paper by a researcher from the Netherlands, they show that by applying isoseq they were able to identify over 1,400 additional potential uh, isoform-specific peptides, so a large reservoir that was previously unknown for identifying these powerful biomarkers. The second example I would like to highlight where ICC can um, uh, have great utility and in addition it's a really nice example showing that if you make errors, if you make mistakes, up front, it can really uh, harm the downstream analysis and the translational um, science. So this paper is in the area of prostate cancer. And of course, for prostate cancer, androgen deprivation therapy is the current standard of care. And it's complicated by the fact that you have these androgen receptor variants, um, ARV7 or ARV9, that uh, can occur, which um, cause resistance and make the patient 
uh, make, make that androgen deprivation therapy ineffective for the patient. So androgen receptor, here's the, um, shown the full gene. And so if you have the full length uh, a androgen receptor gene um, on the top right here, it's eight exons and all in blue. And these variants of androgen receptor can occur, shown here in red, by these cryptic exons. Cryptic, and there's cryptic exon three and cryptic exon five and so forth. And specifically, this androgen variant, uh, androgen receptor variant seven, which is shown in the middle right here, uh, which has this cryptic exon three, uh, has been intensely studied and has been shown to be a potential biomarker for this type of resistance occurrence, has been the subject of inhibitory RNA studies to try to knock down the expression of these particular variants and so forth. And these studies had all relied on the uh, fact that it was thought that this red cryptic exon 3 was specific to ARB7. And so, unfortunately, though, this was not the case. And so this, was, this is what this paper is uh, showing, that um, using ISIS, the isoseq method from PECBio revealed that the previously reported structure of one other of these androgen receptor variants was incorrect. In fact, this ARV9 that was initially previously thought to only have this cryptic exon 5 was actually had 2,400 bases more sequence and significantly harbored both cryptic exon 5 and cryptic exon 3. And you can see now that that's a big problem because all the studies that had assumed that cryptic exon 3 is specific to ARV7 uh, now have to be essentially thrown in the garbage and reinterpreted and worst case have to be redone because CE3 also occurs in ARV9. And so these studies that thought to specifically target one variant were in fact targeting two variants. And so the effect on gene expression is now ambiguous and can't be interpreted and so forth. So I think it's a really powerful example that um, shows that if you want to, uh, if you have incorrect or incomplete information up front, um, there are now literally dozens of studies that have to be redone and reinterpreted. Uh, another example for um, uh, in the area of, of cancer now uh, looking at a gene fusion is uh, work that was done by Australian researchers, again in prostate cancer. This is the fusion between human relaxin 1 and relaxin 2. And the authors described that they had really uh, thrown the kitchen sink of all different technologies at this but were un unable to resolve the structure and the isoforms of this particular fusion gene. Uh, they then applied smart sequencing and were able to um, resolve the complete structure and highlight isoforms. And again, this paper really nicely highlights that it's really important to understand whether you're dealing with the wild type gene or with the fusion gene. And so just focusing your attention on the two, uh, on the middle and the rightmost um, uh, graphs, uh, it shows that in the middle you have the response of the fusion gene, and on the right you have the response of the relaxin-1 wild-type gene. And you can see that they're basically opposite. So uh, the two different isoforms show opposite uh, responses in expression in, these, in this particular cell model when you deprive them of androgen or when you add androgen to the growth media. So if you don't know what you're looking at, uh, you might misinterpret or not at all understand how these cells respond and why. Um, so then with regard to the uh, new chemistry and the new performance of the SQL system, uh, you can expect about a half a million reads of consensus reads, and that gives rise through the um, bioinformatics to about a quarter million of full-length isoform reads. And where this was applied as the last example, um, looking at the uh, NALM6 uh, well-studied cell line, and this is just an example of looking at uh, MUC isoforms, uh, in black on the top are the isoforms of PECBio. In uh, blue on the bottom are the RefSeq annotations. And so you can see that there are isoforms that the isoseq method reveals here highlighted by the arrow that are not found in RefSeq, as well as you can see retained intron events that can often arise in cancer, which are not captured uh, and typically not uh, resolvable with the short read technologies. And so, um, the RNA sequencing um, of the B and T uh, leukemia cells uh, revealed that a subset of 7% of the cases, um, for example, here in this study, uh, are characterized by a DUX4 deregulation. So you can have this overexpression of the DUX4 locus. 
that's linked to um, uh, um, this receptor and activation in the cascade of these transcriptional changes. And so this particular cell line that was sequenced uh, with isoseq that I was talking about is representative of this class of these um, uh, B-cell uh, acute leuke uh, leukemia cancers. And um, in a collaboration of researchers from St. Jude Children's Hospital, um, uh, they found that both short-read RNA-seq as well as uh, Tenex genomics were unable to reveal the complete sequence of this particular fusion driver mutation. Uh, that's because this particular DOX4 um, domain uh, region contains these uh, repeat regions, which are uh, interspersed and dispersed throughout the genome. And so you need long reads, long contiguous reads to map these particular regions. And uh, um, both short read sequencing and 10x genomics uh, sequencing failed, whereas with the PEG biotechnology it was possible uh, just with one smart cell to get continuous sequence information through this particular uh, entire locus, uh, completely resolving IGH region with the uh, DUX4 region. So in conclusion, uh, the isoseq method has been now optimized for the SQL system. Uh, there's no more site selection needed. There's a much simplified both library preparation and also analysis workflow, uh, which lowers the initial cost of generating these types of whole transcriptome data. In many cases, only one smart SQL uh, cell um, is required to unambiguously identify these types of structure brains now at the gene expression level. And um, there's now additional follow-up that the researchers are doing. Um, with regard to uh, T cell and B cell receptor repertoire sequencing, um, researchers from Europe again, uh, from the Netherlands, published a very nice paper um, applying, a, um, optimizing the PCR and then um, applying smart sequencing for full-length immunoglobulin uh, sequencing to identify these rearrangements. So they uh, identified the full-length functional BDJ sequences in cell lines, in primary cells, or in excisional biopsies, and found that through the full-length long-read background sequencing, you can cover the entire BDJ sequences in a single read and thereby uh, get an unbiased comprehensive analysis of the B-cell receptor repertoire in uh, both healthy, reactive, and neoplastic conditions. And this was uh, since followed up by a number of studies looking at the B-cell receptor repertoire in this way for different kinds of uh, cancers, um, these types of lymphomas, and um, uh, following up with other biological studies. So as I mentioned, the uh, uh, library preparation has become much simpler. Um, no more site selection is required. If you are interested in uh, enriching specifically for the longer transcripts for the genes, there is an optional site selection. Um, but this has become much easier compared to uh, back in the RS2 days. And there's a lot more information that's available on our website with regard to targeted sequencing, with regard to full length, uh, whole genome, or transcriptome sequencing. And so I'd like to encourage you to look at that. Um, there are many, <clears throat> excuse me, there are many applications of uh, isoseq. I talked about whole transcriptome sequencing and targeted sequencing. We realize, of course, that um, very hot is single cell uh, sequencing, and so single cell isoseq to look at the transcript structure, uh, not just the counting in single cells, has been demonstrated. Uh, the first paper was by Ian McCauley, who was then at the Sanger Institute a few years back, uh, or actually last year. Uh, no, this was a few years back, I, sh I apologize. Um, looking at some cancer cells, and in uh, the middle panel in B, you uh, see that the PEC biotechnology was able to uh, re reveal and resolve multiple isoforms of these gene fusions, whereas the top and the bottom in red and blue, those are the uh, Illumina short reads that happen to span the uh, fusion junctions. And uh, while you can get that kind of information, the identity of different um, isoforms was hidden. And since then, there have been a number of uh, other papers that have come out. Um, on the uh, isoform diversity in the mouse brain. And then in the bar by our archives, a very new paper by Hagen Tilgner and colleagues looking at single cell isoform RNA sequencing across thousands of cells. This was done not for cancer, this was done in the brain, but I think the method is certainly very applicable to single cell uh, studies on the transcriptome architecture in uh, cancer cells. 
So then finally, I just want to show uh, one slide and say a few words about a technology roadmap. I talked about that we steadily increase the throughput based on the um, uh, high quality foundation and make the workflow easier for the users, and so we're certainly not done. Uh, I mentioned that uh, just yesterday we announced the latest chemistry to increase throughput and accuracy in application updates, so that's shown here in the middle. And then in early 2019, we'll have an improved and uh, simplified library preparation kit that will come out. And then uh, in 2019 and beyond, uh, we'll have a new chip that will have an eight-fold increase in the number of um, sequencing sites, so that'll increase the uh, overall throughput per smart cell run by another factor of eight. So uh, the combination of this latest chemistry update with the 8M smart cell will uh, result in an additional order of magnitude throughput increase over the next 12 months. And so all the things that I've talked about, of course, it then scales into allowing for larger projects in making the uh, existing products, projects faster and more affordable because you have this massively high throughput. So with that, I'd like to uh, finish. I thank you for your uh, attention and the time. And uh, of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Korlock, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. Now let's get started. Our first question is, what is the limit on amplicons with regard to SMRT sequencing? Yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, I think uh, I mentioned that you know there's really we, we don't really see a limit. So um, uh, no matter you know whatever you can make with the PCR long range PCR, um, regardless of how long it is uh, and um, regardless of what kind of sequence it has, sequence complexity it has. Uh, we feel quite confident that you can sequence it with PEC biosequencing. And uh, I've shown some examples with well over 10,000 bases. On the short side, uh, if, if you want to use it for, um, let's say, for variant validation, for example, um, that's fine too. So uh, the small, the shortest PCR amplicons that I've um, seen being sequenced for that purpose are, you know, 100, 200 bases, and you get, obviously, you get perfect reads every time with the CCS uh, mechanism that I talked about. Uh, I should mention that um, we also see opportunities for, um, you know, workflow efficiencies and price efficiencies to, you can really view the, the smart cell as a universal uh, sequencing unit or holder in that you don't have to sequence the same gene or the same target um, uh, separated for different smart cells. You can mix uh, different targets together, and there's much less of a size bias now. Um, so if you have, um, you know, like I mentioned, pcr able amplicons, and then you have uh, other types of amplicons, you can pool and mix them together. Because the sequencing is single molecule sequencing, each DNA molecule is going to be sequenced individually and separately, and they're going to be separated by the barcode and by the sequence uh, by the software. So uh, if you have only a few samples of this type and a few samples of that type, you can mix those together and then you don't have to wait as long. Um, some customers feel like they, they need to wait for the samples to arrive and sort of fill up one worth of smart cell. And uh, in many cases we found it's very successful that just as you view a Sanger plate where you can have many different types of targets and uh, genes on a Sanger plate and sequence those in one run, uh, you can do that uh, with smart sequencing as well. There are no physical boundaries like you would have on a 96 well plate anymore, but um, that separation is afforded uh, at the molecular basis by virtue of the sequencing. So in that case, in that sense, uh, we feel that the sy system is really quite flexible and can be adjusted to uh, quite a large breadth of um, sequencing centers that have very different types of uh, sample throughput as a mean. And do you have tools to do the structural variation calling with PacBio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, we have now a fully functional and uh, mature workflow in our analysis package, which is called SmartLink. 
And the analysis package, uh, SmartLink version 6, which actually also came out yesterday um, concurrently with the new sequencing chemistry, uh, has improved workflow um, for structure variant analysis. Uh, that's faster. It also uh, allows for joint calling if you have, let's say, a child and the two parents, or if you have population cohorts. And significantly, I've only talked about structure variants and defined them as um, genetic variation that's larger than 50 base pairs. But with this new structure variant caller, uh, we actually go down to 20 base pairs, um, all the way to many, many thousands. And we also call inversions and translocations, so a, a, a spectrum of genetic variation that even exceeds structure variation. So that's all available. Um, either in the web interface or for advanced bioinformatics experts in a command line interface that has more flexibility with regard to uh, parameter adjustment and so forth. So uh, yeah, that's the functionality that we realize is very important and we have uh, fully um, incorporated that now in our software. And for our last question, if ethnicity plays such an important role in cancer risk, how are we going to get to precision medicine for all patients? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know yet, right? So, uh, as I showed, we have just begun to reveal the hidden landscape of structure variation, uh, not only in cancer, but even in the normal healthy population. So, I think what has to happen is that we have to sequence a lot more human genomes with this type of um, sequencing approach to get a complete picture of the genetic variation. Then we have to sequence, uh, you know, all types of cancers to understand for the first time comprehensively what is changing in those cancers, uh, get, a, get a real view of these types of complex rearrangements that were so powerfully highlighted by the paper by Mike Schatz that I mentioned um, for the first time. And it really gives a, a new view on um, what is happening in these cancers. Um, so far, We've only had a partial view, and uh, in some cases, the important events, I'm sure, will have been hidden from us. And we have to do that for the different ethnicities. So we need to understand whether lung cancer in an Asian population is different with regard to the common drivers uh, from lung cancer in other eth ethnicities and so forth. So uh, a lot more sequencing has to happen, a lot more data analysis, uh, the creation of dedicated databases of structure variants, common structure variants versus um, cancer-causing variants. And so uh, it's really a, a recapitulation of what's been happening in the um, single nucleotide polymorphism in the SNP-based approaches where you have SNPDB and ClinVar and these types of equivalents now have to be uh, generated. But I think, I think there's no doubt that uh, that will happen over the next few years. And I think there's great potential that uh, this will really significantly um, enhance the therapies and help the lives of, of you know, thousands, ten, tens of thousands of patients. And so we certainly look forward to um, collaborating and, and working with the scientific community and the cancer community to um, taking that path. Well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Korlock for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labrids for making today's educational webcast possible. And before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of 2019. You will receive an email from Labrids letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.